Trigger warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. I've seen a lot of kids like snap, you know, just snap. Right. I, I tried to kill myself when I was there. Really? Um, early on, yeah. I mean, I still had, you know, scars and stuff. Like, and I, like, but all they did, they didn't take me anywhere. They did nothing. They just told me to get up. They put like a bandage on me. And then they made me clean up all the blood. And then I had to like carry a cinder block with my other arm, with my other hand. So it wasn't cut. You are listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast, a podcast shedding light on decades of mental, physical, and sexual abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The testimonies shared on this podcast are told from the personal experience and perspective of the survivors. Not all legal outcomes are known or final. Any suspect is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. To find more information about the Preacher Boys podcast and upcoming documentary, visit PreacherBoysDoc.com or connect on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at PreacherBoysDoc. Now, here is your host, Eric Skwarzynski. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Preacher Boys podcast. I'm so excited to have Gene with me on the show today. Uh, He's a survivor of Camp Tracy uh, in Florida. Uh, Gene, can you just introduce yourself to my audience and let them know just a little bit about you and your introduction to Camp Tracy? My name is Gene. I live in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, Basically, how I got introduced was uh, I was part of a church and my grandma got two of the members to ride with us to the supposed summer camp I was going to spend the summer at. Okay. And... Ended up being Camp Tracy, and I was just dropped off there and left. Okay. That's my introduction to it. <laughs> uh, and how old were you? Um, I was fifteen at the time. Okay. And yeah. what was the what was the reason that they um, what was the reason that they ended up dropping you at this home? Was it was there some kind of perceived like disciplinary issues? Were you did you feel like it was something where they were concerned about something or, or what was the yeah. reason that was given well the reason i was given was you know i was in just out of control basically hmm. but i don't know i kind of think it was more or less like i just refused to listen you know because my grandma she was really southern baptist right she hated the music i listened to and you know i I didn't care. She'd find taste. Well, I think it was more of a controlling thing. She just couldn't control me. That's what I think right now. But the reason given was, yeah, um, he's just not doing what he's supposed to. He's doing bad in school, which I was, but just for a short time. Like I usually did really well in school. Right. Gotcha. So there wasn't like, there wasn't any kind of crazy thing that would like prompt them to do this. Um, so, so when they dropped you off, what was your kind of day one experience arriving at Camp Tracy? When I arrived there, the very first person I saw was Brother Cedric. Okay. And, you know, he was just like, basically, you're mine. You're ours now. <laughs> mm. And uh, at the time, I had like a mohawk. So they, they, they shaved my head. They went through all my things to make sure there wasn't. I guess I, the what the word they used was anything secular or right. you know not you know Baptist, not Southern, but not Christian. If it was anything worldly, they took it out. Sure. And it could have been anything. It could, I mean, right. literally, it could have meant anything. These people were crazy about that kind of stuff. They mm-hmm. found I don't know. We weren't. They're were just weird. Really, very weird. Like very controlling about what you watched and what you listened to what information was given to you right interesting um so what was so so once you got assimilated to actually understand like it was a strict culture and i'm assuming this was a a big i mean huge difference as far as like restrictions and things that you were used to prior to this um yeah most definitely it was just complete 180 from what i was used to I went from, you know, city kids to being on a farm around cows and, you know, yeah, it was, 
it was definitely an adjustment that I had to make very quickly. <laughs> right. And what was the, um, so what was the, like, I mean, so day one, Amy arrived, you find out that they're, you know, obviously very strict, but what was your kind of, um, I guess, day-to-day schedule? Like when you woke up um, through the time you went to sleep, was it a lot of manual labor? Like what was kind of the, the environment there? It was, we'd wake up, uh, we'd have to have our beds made and everything clean, our lockers well organized. It was almost kind of like a pseudo military like thing, you know? Yeah. They, they were trying to do it, but it just wasn't, I don't know. We had to do that. We had to, what do we have to do? We had to like stand at the edge of our bed at four and then brother Bruce or whoever was what we had like five different people watching us five different nights when we didn't have a stable like person to be there which mm-hmm. was they i guess they hated but they hated that place too because they didn't last long they'd be like two months and they'd be going right. anyway so um you know and then well we'd be dressed we'd be ready to go and then we'd all line up we would run all the way to from the boys dorm all the way down to where the girls dorm was which is where you know they all cooked for us because women are supposed to right. cook <laughs> It's weird. It's like the 1950s at that place. It's right. Really, it is. It's like just back in. Uh, and then we have to recite Bible verses. We have to have three. They have three Bible verses. Everyone in unison would have to recite in order to eat. And literally, if you did not memorize it, if they felt you were just mumbling your way through it, you weren't going to eat. It, hmm. They would not let you eat. I've seen right. kids not eat at all because they just couldn't memorize it because they were either really young and still had no clue what was going on because there was a kid there that was like 12 years old. Right. What the hell? But, uh, so we'd eat, um, we'd line back up. Corey, we had to be in a line everywhere we go. So we'd line back up and then we'd run to a, I can't see. It's hard for me to remember the names of certain areas. They were all named. Right. But this is the place where uh, we'd all meet up, and uh, they would assign us to what we're gonna do. Mm-hmm. Like you know, uh, I was assigned like lawn mowers, and you would mow the entire property. It, right. It was always a job to mow because it was so huge, and there's so much grass. So you're yeah. mowing all day long, which was like, if you're there, that was the job you wanted to get because. Nobody messed with you. There's nobody around you. You just mowed. They just left you alone. Right. Which I got kicked off because I just, I don't know. I just wasn't into mowing all that grass. Thing. <laughs> 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 but uh, so they assigned different jobs and it was different things. You could be going off with uh, one of the counselors in the town, so you could help them grab wood for this school, the schoolhouse right. we were building, which their school system was a joke. Oh my right. god. That, what was the that, curriculum? Was it was it like a do it yourself kind of? Yeah, curriculum? yeah, it was like that. It was, it, and you weren't allowed to just fly through it. Like I was just flying through these little books these yeah. that they had, you know, and uh, it all had religious like like undertones to it or something, right? <laughs> Which you know, I felt like I was being brainwashed like the whole time. I felt like like I'm just like I just don't believe in this stuff, right? Uh, forcing me to believe in it is going to make it worse, <laughs> you know? Right. And, and you may have said this, but was your, your background before this wasn't religious whatsoever? Uh, no, I mean, I was raised in a Baptist church, Okay, but I just went because my grandma made me go. Got it. So you yeah. weren't religious, but your family, your yeah, family was. I wasn't. And I think that might've been another thing too. I think she was trying, hopefully maybe if I go to this place that I'll become like, the good little church boy she wants, but you know, that definitely didn't happen. I was a mess when I left that place. Right. Right. So, um, you know, just looking at stuff about camp Tracy, I mean, there's, there's multiple lawsuits and, uh, arrest me. I mean, there were a lot of different things there. Um, citing abuse, physical, sexual abuse. Is that something that you saw during your time there? Did you see a lot of abuse? Cause obviously, you know, there's mental abuse and, and you're in situations that you shouldn't be at 15, but what would you say was kind of the uh, environment? Did you see a lot of like physical abuse at all? 
Yeah, they actually, um, like Brother Cedric had this thing where it, we'd, we'd eat dinner and we'd go to the dorm. And so we had four dorms um, in each, uh, in each, on each side, sorry. It's like one building, a hallway, four dorms on each side. You had about three to four boys in each of those dorms. So he would have us all line up in front of him and everyone would be doing push-ups at the same time. Everybody. Hmm. The first person from the first dorm would run, have to run 10 laps around the building while everyone's doing push-ups. Once he did that, then the next person in that dorm would, in the cycle, he would go on and go on and go on until every, you know, that, you know, I've seen him punch kids in the stomach, slap people in the face. Uh, he smashed my face into a wall hmm. because he found a picture of a camp girl that, because my grandma gave me a camera when she came to visit. And I took a bunch of pictures, like at this huge, just like pit of dead cows that we used to have to crawl into. And you, sometimes your feet would just go straight through. Hmm. It was just, yeah hmm. and uh but yeah he uh he was evil man he was psychologically physically um like i said he he just slammed my face into the wall and was like put your nose on the wall you know stand there don't move and you know of course if i breathed i moved and uh he just rubbed my face in it and uh i actually pushed him off of me and uh because i I, I'm just not going to sit there and take it. And I got, when you did stuff like that, if you fought back, you they would make you carry like cinder blocks. Like you would start off with like two and you'd have to carry those everywhere you went, everywhere. Like literally, if you walk five feet, you have to carry them. And then when you got used to that, then they'd give you three. I seen a dude have to carry four, go back and get the other four and then carry those some, and then go back and get the other four. Yeah. Wow. And how many how many kids were there at the school or the camp? Uh, let's see, four times. Um, at least at the most, I would say like forty, like forty, forty-two oh. people, forty-two, wow. like just boys. Huh. And and then girls and uh. It seems like it. It could have been a little bit less, but I don't think so. Okay, got it. Yeah, because I'm lo- I'm looking through staff here. So, um, so Wilfred McCormick was the director. Um, yeah, he's and the then, head. He's it. like the head of the snake. You know what I'm saying? Right. And then you have right. G- Gary Byram. Um, so when I'm looking through all the all the different articles and things, it appears that, um the people who were actually investigated was John Wilson. Was he there while you were there or no? I see. I was there in, um, 96 to like okay. early 98. Got it. Okay. I don't think so. Okay. Think yeah. Wolf so. McCormick and then Gary Byron. Um, and then, so when so, I was there, what's up? Sorry. Oh no, go ahead. When I was there, um, yeah, it was brother Bruce, brother Cedric, uh, the old guy, school teacher, um, brother Raymond, brother Rocky, hmm. um, and their wives. And right. Maybe, so yeah, those are people that was there. And I was, and plus, there was a lot of people that came and left. Like I said, sure. We even had a cop come in and watch us with his wife, and that hmm. sucked. Imagine having a cop in charge of you. Yeah. Right. That was horrible. Huh. So, um. And there's there's several allegations of sexual abuse. Was there sexual abuse or was it primarily physical, like the like punching in the stomach, things like that? Um, well, I I'm gonna say this. What I can't say is this is my friend. I ran into him. I used to try. I I was hopping trains and I ran to him in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, I, he just like I just told him where I was, and he was like, "Hey, man, I'll get you a bus ticket home." I was like, "Sweet, thank you." And he um, picked me up, and we got to talking about the camp, of course, because that's the only thing that we have in common. Right. So we're talking about it, and he was 18 at the time. Now, I don't know. I don't see any reason for him to, like, lie to me about anything. Yeah. It wouldn't make any sense. But he told me, because when I look back at it now, he used to have an easy time at the camp. He didn't, like, he hardly ran anywhere. Like, we didn't see him half the time. Um. But what he told me was the reason behind that is because 
he was like actively having sex with brother Cedric. Hmm. And, um, and he told me that some of the singing boys that they would, were actually getting pimped out between other members of church as was he. Hmm. You see him being 18, it was legal for him and Cedric to be able to do that. Right. But not the other stuff, whatever. And, you know, and that's, like I said, is why I'm wearing this one. And, you know, I, he, he, and he told me he had other dirt on other members because he was in like just Cedric's little inner circle. Right. So to speak. So, so uh, how- me personally never went, I never was sexually abused, you know, I've, but he was creepy. Like he was, he hated the camp girls, but the camp boys, he, you know, he'd come up behind you and start rubbing your shoulders. Like weird. Not like a friend does it, you know? Right. And, it was creepy. It gave me a horrible vibe. I told him never to do that again, you know, and he, he didn't like me one bit. Me and him, I hated him. He hated me too. I could tell. Right. Right. Yeah. No, it looks like there was a, yeah, there was an investigation in 2008. Um, and it says there were scandals of sexual and physical abuse have plagued the church run camp since the eighties. Six lawsuits by former students have been filed since 2003 against the camp and Harvest Baptist church citing repeated sexual and physical abuse by staff and senior residents, including the founder's younger brothers, Cedric McCormick. The church has settled most of these lawsuits out of court. And it says the latest charges stem from an investigation of sex activity between a group of boys at the camp. The majority of boys who admitted consensual sex could not face charges since they were juveniles. Um, however, one was arrested since he was 18, a legal adult. Uh, those charges have been dropped after the father of the 14 year old say he didn't want to prosecute. Wow. So, now, if you're innocent, you're not just going to be paying people off. Right, right. You're going to go to court. Yeah. Um, yeah. It says several students said Wilson. So yeah. So John Wilson would become physically abused when he became angry. Uh, one victim reported that just a couple of days before, brother John came over to him and started choking before slamming his head into the wall. Um, yeah. So I mean, everything that you're reflecting on, everything that he was saying is, I mean, that's. You can literally look it up. It's docu- like a lot of stuff. Yeah, I, mean, I actually have looked it up. I never got oh. involved with any kind of lawsuits because I, I don't really care about their money. I'd, I'd rather, okay. you know, you know, fa- you know, whatever. I'd rather them get in trouble for it than just pay me off. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause they, so it looks like they shut down in 2013. So you said you were there till 98. Yeah, like I was there mid ninety five to early ninety eight because I turned eighteen. I was turning eighteen, and they knew I was. You know, they knew I was. So I mean, even Cedric and they they used to like paddle us. Hmm. It was weird, you know. They would like make you like like you put your hands on a table and then stick your butt out, and they would like hit you with this like wooden it's nineteen fifties stuff. I'm telling you. Yeah. And then they would like pray or it was just very creepy. Like it totally confirmed to me that there is no God. Hmm. <laughs> like, it was just, it was crazy, man. Yeah. And Cedric, when, what he would do, see, I got the opportunity to see how he did it. Cause everyone's like, his, I guess a swatch, like infamous throughout the camp boys. And, uh, he, what he, like, he's even told me, he's like, I've been waiting for this moment. Like it's so creepy. Hmm. And it, he, he, I could see his reflection in this little like TV that was on a desk, so I could tell what was coming, so I could prepare for it. And what he would do, he would back all the way up, like as far as he could to the wall, and then just run and like hit you as hard as he could. Hmm. And he, I, he's, I've seen him do that. To, well, I haven't seen him, but you could hear him. You know, you stand out in the hallway so you can hear, you know, what's going on, so you know it's coming. Yeah. But. Um. He, was yeah, there, I've seen kids get like 50 swats, carry blocks, fucking three miles, then get swatted again, then carry blocks, then get swatted again. And what were these like, for? Was it just for them, just like simple kind of, I guess, infractions or, or like breaking certain like rules? Or was it like, was that something that happened frequently? Like how, how frequent was this? That was frequently. There wasn't a day that went by that at least five or six people didn't get swatted for something. Wow. There was, there's not a day that went by. There might have been like one day, you know, and that was probably because we're at church or something. Right. We went to church Saturday. No, no, no. We went to church all day and night Sunday. We never left, hmm. which I didn't mind going because it got us like out away from the camp, you know. 
But and then uh, sometimes you got your parents would come if you're lucky enough to have your parents live in Jacksonville. Yeah. A lot of these kids are from like across the country. They're from all over the place. I was going to say, yeah, so you were there for, I mean, two and a half, almost three years. How often did you see, um, how often did you actually see your family and were they aware of all this stuff that was going on? Yeah, they, I mean, the kids would tell them what was going on and nobody, as far as I saw, lied once to their parents because I, because, hmm. you know, they would, they didn't care if there's camp boys around. They didn't like, sometimes they would take you off, but everybody knew what was going to happen. Right, you know, it was going on anyway. Right, and but yeah, you're you know they would come to church, and my grandma got banned from coming to see me for like, I guess like four months or something, because she gave me the camera, and she took pictures of the camp girls, and I had a picture of one in my closet, which was led to that earlier thing I told you about where he was slamming my face into the wall. Right. So they banned her. They banned her from coming. Said you can't come see your child, and legally they could do that because she signs them were signed over to them yeah. some of them were just some kids were just dropped off because their parents didn't want them wow um, like one kid was raised by that place raised by it and then they kicked them off the bus one night at their church to say get off the bus we don't want to see you anymore and then he showed up like five months later and he looked like crap yeah. like he was like homeless and you know but he had nowhere to go yeah was, was there ever a point i mean i know it wasn't a good experience. I know that it wasn't um, like, it seems like it just strengthened your resolve to not be a part of what they were trying to get you to be a part of. But was there ever a point when you're, re you're reading the same stuff every day, you're being told the same stuff every day. Was there ever a point where you're like, are they right? Should I buy into what they're doing? Like, or was it the whole time through you're counting your days till you're, you're out? I was counting my days, man. But what I what what I did do because what they had was an evaluation, okay. and it had these it had these stupid categories, and you get rated on it, and right. you know spirituality and character, you know, whatever. Yeah. But like, I I followed their rules. I learned my bio. I I kind of like you know was manipulating a system just by doing what they wanted me to do. I didn't believe in any of it, mm -hmm. you know. And I was actually on top of the evaluation. Wow. Now, when they when they found the picture of the camp girl, they found the picture of the cow pit that I took of all the dead cows that we had to dig through. Um, and when they found that, I went from the top all the way to a bottom. I right. didn't make any steps. I just went straight to the loo. Right. And they actually had two separate dorms there. One dorm was run by uh, Brother Leonard and Miss Lisa. Okay. And, uh, Brother Leonard, he's just, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it more than just to do with bad luck, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, he he was he he could be abusive, and he was more mentally abusive. Like like you know, okay, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna take a break. Okay, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna. And we would never end up taking any kind of break. Right. You know, he would do stuff like that. Right. But that door was for the guys that had been there for a while, and. They felt, you know, it was almost like a trustee thing. But you got a better bed. Um, you could kind of watch movies when they weren't trying to fast forward and mute it and stuff like that. <laughs> Through every little thing that was in the movie. But that was for, like, basically, like, if you got there, then you had a little bit more freedom almost. You know, you didn't have to work as hard as everybody else. But everyone looked at you like you were just, like, a suck-up. Right. You know? Right. Um, the way a lot of the camp kids did, but they had to survive somehow. They didn't want to get beat every day. We're sick of it. Yeah, you have to kind of play into the program just to get through. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's why. Were, were there kids that did, I mean, buy into there it? Kids that, that, there were kids that genuinely believed in, like, you know, God and stuff like that. And uh, But not, not when they left there, probably not. I mean, because... Uh, I've seen a lot of kids like snap, you know, just snap. Right. I, I tried to kill myself when I was there. Really? Uh, early on, yeah. I mean, I still had, you know, scars and stuff. Like, and I, like, but all they did, they didn't take me anywhere. They did nothing. They just told me to get up. They put like a bandage on me and then they made me clean up all the blood. And then I had to like carry a cinder block with my other arm, with my other hand. 
and so it wasn't cut as bad as the other one. Right. And how old was how old were you then? Uh, I had it been like probably sixteen. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Um. You you had mentioned um. So you'd mentioned a like a pit, you know, like something about like dead cows. Like what was what was going on with that? It was this huge pit, like a pit. You know, like a, right. a pit, like Salem, the Salem's lot for cows is okay. the best way I can try to describe it. Right. But they were ropers. They were cowboys, you know, like Wilford's a cowboy. His son, Derek's a cowboy. They, you know, they drive trucks. I mean, he's got all kinds of stuff going on. Right. You know, he makes, he makes money you know, all outside from the camp through his cows, you know, but, um, but the cow pit, it was basically a pit with, dead rotting corpses of cows hmm. and they needed the ropes off their necks because what they would do they would drag them into the pit and for some reason just leave the rope on it so we would have to go get them hmm. and i tell you you would step on a cow and your foot would like just fall through it it's just so decayed yeah. it's right. disgusting and you could smell it the smell it you could smell the smell of death when we got close to it right it's crazy um so when you when you left at eighteen, what was kind of the the process of leaving? Do they just do they just drop you off? Do you just walk out the front? Like, what yeah, happened? My grandma came and picked me up. Okay. Um, and then that was it. And then mm-hmm. they had this they had this thing where the graduation. You know, I just went to it just because I I did. Uh, well, not the graduation from school. Graduation from like just leaving. I guess I don't know. It's something stupid. But they guess what they want you to do is they want you to go to their schools that's at their church. Because before you – okay, here's something that happens before you leave. Wilfred will put you in his truck. This is how you know you're leaving. So you'll get in his truck, and I'll drive you around the camp, and I'll be saying, you know, when you get out of camp, you're probably going to want to go to a different school. They're like, of course, I don't. <laughs> but what he's doing is trying to get you to go to his school. So he keeps <laughs> generating that money from your parents. So you basically you'll be going from that hell to this hell because they'll paddle you there too. Right. Wow. Really the only kids that go to that school are the kids of the families that are at the church. It's very, it's that place. When I look at it now, when I look back on it, it was, it, it was like such a cult to yeah. me. It was because they did not allow any outsiders in that church. Mm-hmm. It was always the same congregation. Like it, when people would come in and check it out, they would just like shun them, so to speak. They just wouldn't talk to them. Right. Like, just, you know, it was it was weird. They, the The whole church would buy the preacher a gold Cadillac. You know, they they treated him more like their god than their. You know what I'm saying? Right. It was weird. Right. Um. So, what, now having been out of it for you know, I mean, well over 20 years now. Um. What are some of the ways? Obviously, you were there for a formative time of your life. 15, 18 is when you, I mean, you're developing as a person. Um, you know, how has your experience affected you to this day? And, and what are some things that um, that going there affected? Hmm. I, of course, like when I got out, I, I just really just wanted to do what I wanted to do, hmm. you know. So I really didn't have much structure i had no structure at all actually you know because i didn't i didn't really i just had someone that told me when i did something wrong i would get paddled or punished you know punished severely for it right so i wasn't having none of that i was like no i'm gonna do exactly what i want to do what i want right. to do and it really messed up a good portion of my life like i finally just recently like three years ago so i just got my life together and i'm doing pretty good right but you know, of course, some of it was my own decision, but a lot of it, I mean, the very beginning when I got out of that place, I was like, oh, I'm never going through that again. Like, I don't know. I just wanted mm-hmm. to forget about it. Like, just, right. that's why I didn't even know all these lawsuits were happening, but I just knew I've never, I don't know. And then after a while, I started thinking, I'm like, you know, how can I, how can I just get this out there? You know, I'm tired of it being on my mind. I'd rather just keep it. Right, like, you know, it's easy to talk to my girlfriend about it, but right. this is this is kind of difficult for me. I mean, 
No. But I mean, I'm getting used to it, so we're doing good. Right. Have you since I know you connected with one um, one fellow student who is also there? Uh, have you connected with anybody else from there? Have you have you? Yeah, I've to- actually I actually talk sort of regularly to regularly to this one guy, and uh, I talked to him, and then every now and then I talked to this other dude, and there was that guy in Atlanta that I was talking to. Got it. So, yeah, I still, I still, I there's, I have to. I feel like you know, we all went there got together. I'm gonna try see if I can find someone I can talk to. You know, right? And one of them has been the prison. You know, he said that place really messed him up too. And he actually got a lot of, a lot of. He was, he got it bad there. No, so bad for him. Well, I gotta imagine it's gotta be, it's gotta be lonely trying to explain. You know, because it is such a unique experience. And, and while I mean, by no means is it a small, you know, group of the population that's been affected by these homes. It is a abnormal experience. And so to find people who do understand and to find people who, you know, do resonate with those experiences can't be easy. Um, it, it, I, I guess I, I mean, my question too would be, you know, obviously you said like it affected you, it, you know, there's other people who've you know, been d- deeply affected, even ended up, you know, in prison or, or homeless or, you know, fill in the blank. Um, what yeah, I've been the- all of those. I've been all of those, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, I mean, and a lot of that's because again, your formative years going through this, you know, horrific experience. Do, do you, f- what was kind of the makeup of people that were there originally? Did, were there kids there who, you know, was it all kids who were like you who it's kind of like, well, what exactly am I doing here? Or was there, you know, was it? No, there's some kids that were like court ordered there. Got it. So <laughs> it know, was a there, very broad spectrum. There were gang members, they yeah. had gang members there, uh, you know, stuff like that. There, there is all kinds of rough kids there, but there are were some that were, were, I don't even know. I was like, why are you even here? What did you do? You yeah. know? Like one of one of my good friends, like who I ran into not too long ago in a mental ward, actually. Mm. Um, that's a whole, whole other thing. But uh, he was a. Uh, I, I don't. I don't. I met his mom. I met his sister. Like they're friends with my grandma and me. Like we went like uh, when we had a chance for us all to get there. I went all to eat and stuff. I was like, why is this kid here? But he 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 was real skinny. I guess. If you wanted to not be politically correct about it, you could call him like a nerd or a dork or something. You, you know, to them, that's what he was. And he, he got it, he he got it really bad. I, I I'm not sure if he was ever sexually molested, but he's he he said that uh, one time one of the the actually the cop that was the dorm father at the time made him take a shower and stood there and watched him take a shower. Hmm don't know why i I think he said uh, i I don't know i guess because he said he stunk or something but he stood there and watched him take a shower you know right it was already weird that there was a cop watching us it was weird that this cop is now watching this kid take a shower and he told me that while i was there while we were there you know yeah he's not gonna make that up it's it's too weird why would you tell someone that if you were right (laughs) Yeah, no, it's super, yeah, super interesting. There, there's a lot of stories and everything you're saying, like, as I'm, you know, pulling up all these different pieces of information, like they're, it all resonates and it's hard to believe it. And this is my thing with the troubled teen industry as a whole is that like these stories are so unbelievable and it, you know, when you think of this kind of stuff, it just, it doesn't seem like it would be this widespread group of these, you know, dozens, of, if not more of these homes, like hundreds of homes across the U.S. that operate in these very aggressive ways. Um, and then, I mean, the one that, the one that you brought up, you're the first person I talked to from this one, but like when you start looking at all the information, the charges that were brought up, charges that were dropped, you know, um, allegations that were made, it's it's jaw dropping that it stayed open as long as it did. Um, yeah. I, I was surprised that in like 2000 and whatever, it's like, 
I, I just thought about it because I had forgotten about it for a while. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I actually don't think about it. It's yeah. not on my mind. You know, and like one day I was just like, I wonder if that freaking place is still open. I looked it up and I was like, it is. And then later I called about it and then they told me that it actually been changed to a place where men can go to get rehab after they detox. I was mm. like, right. They just need people to run their farm for them. I think that's what that was. It was just another way for them to get people to go out there and work for free. Right. Right. That's crazy. So is it still open now as something else? Cause it's, I know Kansas actually, closed in 13, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I actually drove back there two days ago. Oh, well, wow. I don't, I don't, I don't live. I live like 30 minutes, 30 minutes from it right now. Hmm. So I live on the West side of Jacksonville and it's in Glen St. Mary. Right. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I went in there and, uh, of course, it it looked different, but a lot of the same buildings were there. So I was able to point out, you know, there's Brother Leonard's door. And that's where I stayed when mm-hmm. there. But I couldn't go to the back of the camp to yeah. where um, the boys' dorm was. That's where I wanted to go, but I couldn't go back there. But, yeah, it looked like there's just random people living on it, like that mm-hmm. have nothing to do with each other, you know. So I'm really, I'm really not sure. I, I haven't even I haven't looked into all that, like, because I just drove back the other day. I, I thought it was abandoned, but it's definitely not abandoned. There's like hmm. several different cars and the whole, the old gym. It looks like it's like a parts manufacturer or something. Interesting. Um, so what's been most helpful for you? Like, I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, the stuff you experience stays with you, but what's been most helpful for you as far as like moving into the next chapter of your life, trying to process, you know, a lot of the trauma and traumatic events that you saw experience, um, what's been most helpful for you in kind of processing that? Uh, well, actually, I just, I, I just talked to my girlfriend about it. <laughs> really, yeah. Actually, talking about it makes it, you know, I mean, it wasn't all terrible, bad. There were, yeah. you know, we did have managed to have some good times there. Right. I mean, there are few and far between, but you know, just between the boys, you know, you do develop like friendships there. Yeah. You know, like a couple still I carried on, I carry on today. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, it's, it is tricky. Anytime you spend a large portion of life with, you know, three years, four years, some people spending, you know, in some of these, not in the schools, but in some of these churches, 20 years, you know, you, you're spending a large portion. So you're going to have some good things that you're going to connect with. You're going to have friendships that you made and bonds with people that, you know, obviously wish could have been made in better circumstances but yeah it's it's interesting how you know you have to compartmentalize those things and like separate those good things from those bad things um i don't know how i do this but i just i just don't let it bother me i just try not to let it bother me i got better things to worry about now than what happened there no but it does feel better to be able to get on a platform like this and at least tell about some of the stuff that actually happened there because yeah. I don't think anyone really knows like on a bigger scale than you yeah. know me and 10 people, you know? Right. So that actually like when uh, the person who got me into this got a hold of me, it was very random. Like I got this message. He was asking if I was Jean and if I went to Camp Tracy and I was like, yeah, sure. And then that's all this hmm. came to be. Got it. So, so what is the goal? Um, I mean, obviously like you're sharing your story, which I appreciate. I know, I know listeners do as well, but what's, what's your goal in sharing your story? Is it, is it the catharsis of getting to, you know, talk about something that happened that you don't get to talk about often? Is it, um, are you hoping to see some kind of change at a bigger scale than just Camp Tracy? Um, what's kind of the goal? I I mean, I would hope if places are like that, that they would just change immediately. I mean, right. Do background checks on people because there's no way. Some, I mean, some. Of, I don't believe anyone they had, you know, any kind of background check. They're just glad somebody's there to do whatever. You know, right. Do work. Yeah. No, I'm pulling up the uh, the staff list. Um, I just had it up, but pulling up the staff list. I mean, you're looking at the um qualifications and like Wilfred McCormick no education or training in psychology you know Byram no qualifications um I mean, qualification. yeah none of them well, had... see one of the camp boys 
one of our counselors was actually a camp boy, brother Bruce, Bruce Scott. He was, yeah, he was actually a, a camp boy. So he was just doing what he learned, you know, right. I was, uh, you know, he didn't know any better. That's, that was his life. Yeah. He had a wife there. He had kids there, uh, you know, do you do you think there's a place um because obviously you know you, you mentioned some change do you think there's a place for i i guess quote unquote the troubled teen industry for you know reform schools or whatever you want to call them do you, do you think there is a place for programs like that or do you think it's just a flawed concept <laughs> i actually think it's just a flawed concept really i mean i I, I, I don't know because I have kids. I can never put them through that. Ever. Mm-hmm. There's no way. I would do I would try my – they were troubled. You know, maybe their parents should just taught their kids. I don't know because that's what I would do. But, I yeah, I mean, I might be being a little biased because I was in one. But at the same time, since I was in one through one that – I mean, it didn't work, you know. I mean, yeah. they want to tell you that all these kids go off and do great things. But I guarantee you many of them do not go off and do great things. Right. You right. know, because yeah. that place messes with your head. It makes it, you, you don't even know what's going on. It's like being in jail. You don't know anything that's going on in the outside world. You have little contact with family. My dad died while I was in there and they let me go home one night. And I think the night that I got back, I actually got paddled for something. Wow. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, they didn't have the balls to tell me straight up. Preacher Rick Warren got from his church and he's like, we want to pray for one of our camp boys. They're blah, 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 died. And I was like, man, I feel sorry for that guy. And I'm like, oh, it's me. You know, then my grandma told me, I'm like, what, what is this? No one else needs it. I don't care. These people know about that. You know? Right. Right. Um, and I'm just kind of, as we're, as we're drawing a close, I'm just curious with, um, with your, with your experience and, and with thinking through these programs, if you could say something to someone who's been through one of these programs, like, or maybe someone who's going through one currently um, and is just about to get out, like if you could, if you could pull them aside and tell them something, what would you want them to know? Don't let this place dictate your life, (laughs) you know, Mm. for really, because I think that's what it does for a lot of what it did for a lot of them. Like it kind of did me. So, no, yeah, I just think it's, I don't know, I don't, I mean, I just, I just don't think you could ever really trust that kind of a system where adults have so much power over kids, especially not their own kids, Yeah. you know, because some people tend to treat other kids that aren't theirs like crap, Yeah. you know, yeah. so I don't know if you could ever really trust it. <laughs> hmm. No, um, and, and then just one last thing, I'm, I'm just curious with the, um, like with some of these kids and you hit on it a little bit, but what do you wish? So like take, take your situation, for example, if they felt this need to like, you know, they needed extra help or whatever the reason was that they sent you, what do you wish they would have done? And and when you look at these other cases of kids, even in maybe who were, who did have behavioral problems or fill in the blank, what do you think should have been done to help them? It's like instead of sending them there or yeah. after. Yeah. Like instead of sending them there, like if, in a, in a perfect world where, you know, the trouble team programs are not in existence, like what would be the more effective way or alternative to help? I mean, I mean, I want to say, you know, maybe like some kind of therapy, but then I don't know if I even trust that, you know, yeah. and maybe, uh, I guess, like, I think a lot of it is that I know with me, my grandma is very unaccepting of what I, you know, what I liked and stuff. And I don't, I don't know. I would, if she would, I think if she would have been a little bit more, you know, if you want to listen to punk rock and metal music, go ahead. Yeah. But everything would have been a lot smoother between us. Just, I mean, mm-hmm. it's just music, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm like 14, 13. I just, this is the music I like. I don't like gospel. No. Have you talked to her? I know I said that was the last one, but have you talked to, or or did you get to talk to her at all um, after coming back? And did she ever express any concern about like what you had actually been through? 
No, really, she like like she was a very very God fearing Christian. Like she had total faith in that place, mm. and I I don't even think she blamed that place for me not. You know, I was just I was just way worse when I got back. Mm. You know, and I I think that had a lot to do with me my anger towards her too, as well as yeah. her sending me to that place and me missing out on like part of my teenage life. Right. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, I appreciate you sharing your story and, and, you know, like I said, I'm, I, I'm only speechless when I start finding out at these schools because I mean, beginning of this year was the first, I had known about one school um, at the beginning of this year when someone reached out to me and started explaining that there are hundreds of these types of schools. Um, it just blew my mind. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful for everybody that's coming on shedding a spotlight on this. And I know that, you know, like you said, it's, it's good to talk about, but I know it's also not an easy subject to go back and think about and talk about and explain. So I appreciate you doing that. Yeah, you're welcome. No problem. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes and don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.